Good afternoon. Come on, y'all. Good afternoon. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate your spirit. Um, and welcome uh, to today on CBC talking about criminal justice reform. Um, this is a, a moment unlike any other we've had in the history of the United States thinking about criminal justice. It's an, a moment unlike what we, what we had <clears throat> before we had anything like criminal justice, when what we had was we had property-related justice. It feels a little bit too close to that today. Today, in the midst of preparing for a natural disaster, when our federal resources have been subverted to put people in cages, today when we are talking about a permanent appointment to the highest court on the land, and today when we are seeing a retreat of the federal government's enforcement of <clears throat> basic common sense civil rights that improves public safety. That's the moment we find ourselves in. Good afternoon, my name is Philip Atiba Goff. I'm the Franklin A. Thomas Professor in Policing Equity at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, <clears throat> NYU and Columbia. I'm also the president of the Center for Policing Equity. It's my pleasure to be here and to moderate this panel. Um, <clears throat> my job today is to bring your spirits with us as we navigate a journey down the different perspectives we have here on the dais, to help keep these folks in time, on time, and right on time, <clears throat> and to make sure that we have a chance to hear from you as we have this conversation. I don't want to be too long. Right? <clears throat> what I do want to say, though, is this. In a moment when lies and deception seem to be the currency, in a moment when outrage seems to be the coin of the realm, it's more important now than ever that in criminal justice reform, we take away the elements of <clears throat> drama, the elements of scene composition, and we get down to the facts. Now, for those of you who know me before today, I am a nerd professionally. For those of you who've known me personally, I am also a nerd in my spare time. Um, so it's important to me that we deal directly with the issue of data. But beyond data, beyond the ability to hold law enforcement accountable to its values with the things that we can measure, which is within our grasp, beyond that, I want to say today, throughout this panel, it is important that we stick to the facts that we stick to what's real. And let me give just a little bit of a, of a context for that. In the midst of all this national politics, all the, what is local politics here in DC, there is another thing happening around the nation. In New York, where my wife tells me I live, <clears throat> we have seen something unprecedented. Stop, question, and frisk was ruled unconstitutional. So they stopped it, mostly, and this amazing thing happened. Calls for service went up. Crime, murder in particular, went down. You can stop doing the deterrence-focused policing, get community buy-in, and at the same time make everybody safer. But not only in New York is this happening. I want to tell you about Las Vegas. It's not just a place that you go to make terrible decisions. It's a place where terrible decisions may happen to you. In 2011, the Las Vegas Police Department came to us at the Center for Policing Equity and said, we are hurting too many people. We're putting too many people in the hospital. I said, well, what's going on? They said, we don't know. We need some nerds. I said, nerds here at your service. And when we went through their use of force histories, it turned out so many of them were from foot pursuits. We said, what the heck is your foot pursuit policy? They said, our what? I said, okay, first you should, you should have a foot pursuit policy. But beyond that, we found that foot pursuits in Las Vegas tend to end in a peculiar way. They don't end how you think they end. They don't end with the old black cop tackling the guy and saying, I'm getting too old for this stuff. They old when the young individual who can outrun the old guy who's out of shape and panting and wheezing realizes I can outrun, outrun him, but I can't outrun a radio. Please don't hurt me. But that officer has been in fast pursuit. Their adrenaline is up. They know that that person's a bad guy because only bad guys run. And around any corner could be somebody there to hurt me. So by the time I show up, 
I'm giving you a shot to the kidneys just for the price of making me run. That's unnecessary. But from a human psychology perspective, it's understandable. So we said, give us one policy. The first person who arrives after a foot pursuit can't be the first person to put hands on them. And in Las Vegas, to this day, a 23% reduction in use of force, an 11% reduction in officer-related injuries. But not only New York and not only Las Vegas. Let me tell you about Minneapolis. Minneapolis, the scene of Jamar Clark, right? the recent Delvin shooting, a place that has been in, in our national news in a way that we're not used to from Minneapolis. When we think about blackness, we think about race in Minneapolis, we've only ever thought about Purple and Prince previous. And now, it is a place that is a center nationally for issues of police reform. But let me tell you about Minneapolis, which just had, to, had an unreasonably high level of use of force. And they did what all police departments around the country and most of the modern world do. They used CompStat to hold themselves accountable for crime. CompStat is a system where they use the data on crime to say, we see a trend going up. Let's go and, and use our brains, work with community to get those trends going in the other direction. They've been using CompStat like that for a generation of law enforcement like everybody in the United States that has access to a computer, a badge, and a gun. We simply went to them and they said, there are other data available to you. There's data on housing shortages, on food insecurity. There's data on substance abuse. There's data on child abuse. Use that as a way to show you where services are needed that don't require a badge and a gun. Go there with social workers. Go there with mental health professionals. Go there with public health professionals that specialize in substance abuse. Minneapolis, as of a month and a half ago, announced that since working with us on a new ComStat, a ComStat that would be for justice and not just a ComStat for crime, has reduced use of force across the board by 48% in under a year. So in addition to all of the worst stories about what humanity is capable of happening entirely too close to home, we are in a moment when just common sense connected with nerdiness having to do with data makes, us, makes it possible that our values can be enforced, that we can hold police accountable to our values and everybody becomes more safe. And I think the best news out of all of that is that when I go talk to police chiefs, and I go talk to activists, they have roughly the same set of wish lists. Union reform, de-escalation and better training, better data accountability, better resources going to the community, not just to police departments. So in a moment, we're going to hear from a distinguished panel of folks who share a set of values, not always from the same experience, not always from the same orientation. We may not recognize their words as our own, for sure. There will be disagreements up here. But I am proud to be a part of a movement that is based in fact and not distracted by the worst of what humanity has to offer. So in this moment, when we are seeing that, and my guess is in the hour and a half that we're going to be in here, somebody will break news about something incredibly stupid and inhumane that somebody is doing, possibly even, even in this city. While we are here, let us not be distracted. While we are here, let us use facts to move forward so we have a more perfect union, more aligned with our fundamental values of human decency, fairness, and justice for all. So first, I'll introduce them as they come up, um, but first is my friend, <clears throat> uh, the immediate past president uh, of Noble, National Association of uh, Black Law Enforcement Executives, Clarence Cox, right? <clears throat> um, previous also National First Vice President, and in his uh, new role, President Cox has vowed to strengthen service delivery and community impact, create a noble women's advisory council, black women, um, in law enforcement, has been a powerful force, continue to har harness noble's unique expertise within law enforcement and ensure equity in the administration of justice. Please join me in welcoming Clarence Cox. Thank you, Dr. Goff. My friend, every time I come behind you, I have to change my speech. So again, thank you. <laughs> I'm certainly happy and privileged to be before this distinguished panel and certainly you, the audience, who are concerned about our country as it relates to criminal justice and the reform that's needed. Um, I was really happy to hear Dr. Goff talk about the ComStat 
um, the new revised ComStat because I've often said, and who have heard me before, heard me talk about stat-driven policing increases mass incarceration. So as he talks about the inclusion of the social issues in the community as related to policing changes that narrative. And I'm, I'm certainly happy and I hope that trends like some of the other things, body-worn cameras and others. But as you know, over the last couple of years, we've had some traumatic experiences in communities of color as it relates to policing and the profession of policing across this nation. But I'm glad to know that someone had the foresight to start the body camera and the cell phone video movement because that has given America a front row seat to some of the injustices that we often see. And it's a shame that that happens, but I, I come to tell you today that there's just only a small portion of our colleagues or the folks that work in the protection field that are creating these disproportionate alarming rates of use of force. I'll also say it's unfortunate that there's no real collection of data other than the Washington Post and folks like Dr. Goff who collect that. That's an unfortunate thing as you know, a taxpayer and a community, community member that we have to deal with. So Noble has been advocating that police agencies across the country voluntarily submit that data so that we will have some sort of measuring tool to determine what changes need to be made. Uh, the FBI agreed to house this data and we did a survey recently where we sent out uh, requests asking members to go in and, and, and uh, voluntarily do this. And out of 18,000 law enforcement agencies across the country, less than 5% wanted to participate. So that's not something that I can change or, or any of the folk on this dais can change, but that's something that you can change by making a demand in your community that if your agencies in your community are not using the 21st century policing recommendations, then you ought to want to make a real strong and conservative effort to change your leadership. So when you get back home after today's uh, assembly, I encourage you to speak with the folks who lead your public safety and your policing in your neighborhoods to talk more about what are you actually doing and, and talk about the policies that govern the officers who patrol your community because that's going to be the catalyst to drive it in the right direction. And the only way that we'll do that is to have an outcry from folks like you who sit here as concerned citizens of your community. I invite you to go out also to look at the recommendations of the 21st century policing because it's a heavy document that kind of involves a lot of community engagement. You know, you shouldn't ought to be forced in your policing. The police shouldn't just force their, their policies and, and things like that on you because you as a citizen, you ought to be able to kind of navigate what you want in your community as citizens from your police department. If folks aren't reaching out to you to talk to you and engage you as a community, that's part of the problem. We've, we've learned a long time ago that communication is a key to a relationship. And I often say, and you've heard this before, but this has been one of the worst tools in our society because this has kind of uh, decreased our ability to communicate. We don't have conversations anymore. We don't ask how you're doing, and, and we were texting saying your dinner's in the microwave, I'll be home at six. So part of that is communication, but we're bad actors when it comes to policing for marketing ourselves. Police officers do great things across this country every day, each and every day. Only the bad things are highlighted, and that's unfortunate, but that's our fault. And a lot of it partly is because of our policies. Um, most of my career has been drug law enforcement, and um, a bit of that was dictated by a policy that said that I could not associate with certain kinds of folk. 
And everybody's got folks that they're related to that's got some problems. But I could remember not being able to associate with cousins or folks who chose to do something different than I did. Uh, and it was a strain. So because of that, I missed a, not, a lot of opportunity probably to learn something from some of those folks who were doing some things that they shouldn't have been doing. And as a result of that, that's a sort of a, 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 a kind of a, a, the norm for police officers. We put ourselves in a box that we don't associate with certain kinds of folks. And as a result of that, we lost a lot of leverage and a lot of contact with the community. But we still go to the barber shops, the beauty shops, the churches, the grocery stores, and all those things that everybody else does. But we're different. And the other piece to this, and I'll be short with this, is our ability to communicate with our young folk. I don't know how many times when I did wear a uniform back several, several years ago, I'd walk into a store or walk where there was a child acting out, and the first thing the mother would say is, I'm going to have that cop lock you up. You've heard it. You've probably done it. That creates a problem because that's all that child knows from that point until another encounter is how that police is always going to lock you up. And that's not true. That's not true at all. So for me, Noble has been a ministry, so to speak, because as I told you, majority of my career is in drug law enforcement. So I spent a lot of time putting mamas and daddies in jail and watching those kids stand in the driveway cry and wait for defects or a family member to come and, and, and take them on. So that image of me locking mom and daddy up created a bad narrative with that child. So they grew up with that stigma saying the cops are bad folks and we're really not. So just recently, my last stint as a chief was a police chief at a school district, the largest, the fifth largest in Georgia, where I changed my whole methodology as it relates to children. We talked about not putting these young folks in jail, but we talked about doing a lot more as far as communicating. And to Dr. Goss' point is a lot of times the folks who get in trouble are missing something. They're missing a service. Had a child, and this is my last one, who stole a lunch for a very long time um, in a district where all the, all the kids ate free or reduced lunch. And one of my officers was going to arrest this child, and I said, man, what's going on with this? He said, well, this kid's been like, um, uh, stealing food for a couple of weeks here, and I just didn't do anything, and I'm tired of it, and I'm going to arrest him. Talked to the kid, found out the kid was in a uh, single family home, daddy left, Mama was living in a extended stay hotel and she worked at night. And the only way this kid could eat was to take that food so he would have something, you know, uh, for the next, uh, till the next day. I say that to say a lot of times if we look a little bit further and, and we're asking and, and employing our officers to do it, look a little bit further because sometimes there's a situation that doesn't necessarily involve arrest. There's a situation that involves a social service. And each of us know that we have nonprofits and service providers in our community, but most of them don't even know who each other are. So therefore, the folks that need the services never get put into a system to receive those services. So those are some of the things that I'd like to see you do when you go back to your communities. Identify the service providers. Look at trying to put these people in situations that will better them from these nonprofits and don't depend on the police to do everything. I thank you and I look forward to further dialogue. Thank you, Clarence. <clears throat> Our next speaker um, came to us uh, across a large body of water. Um, <clears throat> Honorable Clive, Lewis, uh, Clive Anthony Lewis is a British labor politician who has been the me uh, uh, member of parliament, that's the MP, for Norwich South since winning the seat at the 2015 general election. He studied at the University of Bradford before being elected to various student union roles and then serving as vice president of the National Union of Students. Lewis then worked as a TV reporter for BBC News, I think I caught you on there once or twice, becoming BBC Look East's chief political correspondent. He was also one of the labor government's national black role models. In 2006, he passed out of Sandhurst as an infantry officer with the Territorial Army, and he served a three-month tour of duty in Afghanistan in 2009. Um, I have 17 more pages 
on uh, this individual. Um, he was best drawer in second grade. Um, his mother says that he was incredibly polite. Um, but here's the thing I think that it's important for us in this room to know about if, if we don't understand um, uh, UK politics. Um, uh, uh, importantly, across the globe, we're seeing a rise in, in far-right politics. We're seeing a, a retrenchment in toughness over kindness and generosity. It's really important that where we have leaders, that the leaders be more interested in doing their jobs than in keeping their jobs. And the Honorable Clive Lewis has done that time after time, breaking from party lines, stepping away from positions of power um, because principle was more important. So it's my pleasure. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Clive Lewis. I was the best in my class at Jorah, not second best, but I <laughs> got that bit wrong. Uh, it's lovely to be here. Thank you very much. And um, I think the first thing I'll say is, Whilst there are many differences in terms of the justice system and police enforcement in the United Kingdom and the US, there are also many similarities. Um, one, of the, one of the first things, I'll come through to some of the stats in a minute, uh, just to give you an idea, a flavor of how things have a very similar stats, statistics, I think you'll recognize here in the United States when it comes to black people and the justice system and policing. But, I think, first of all, I'll tell you a little story I was thinking of while I was sat there um, about what, how black people think about policing um, when it comes to how they'll be treated. And it reminds me of when I was younger, I, I, was, I wasn't always just the best drawer and a little bit of a, a, little bit of a, a smart, smarty pants. I was also a little bit of a, a git, to be quite frank, excuse my language. Um, and uh, I, I stole my friend's skateboard and hid it uh, at the side of our house. And um, my dad watched me do this. And when this boy's um, father came and said, is this skateboard, has your son seen our skateboard? I said to my dad, no, I've not seen a skateboard, dad. It's, it's, not, it's not like the George Washington story. I was a little, I was a lot worse. And a cherry tree. And I said, no, I haven't seen a skateboard. And my dad said to the man, so leave him with me for, for five minutes. And he took me in, and he started shouting at me and saying, where is it? Where is it? And I kept on lying and lying. And in the end, he said, if you tell, if you tell, me, I, if you tell me the truth, yeah, tell me the truth, I won't wallop you. And I said, I thought, oh, okay. And he said, um, I thought, I could get away with this. So I said, okay, I did take it. What up? <laughs> and I said, you said, you said, you weren't gonna, you weren't gonna, you weren't gonna smack me for taking it. So that wasn't for taking it. That was for lying to me. Yeah. And he said to me, if a policeman brings you back to this house and he tells me that you've been stealing or he tells me that you've done something wrong, I need to be able to trust you. You know where you stand with a thief. You know where you stand with a murderer. You don't know where you stand with a liar. I need to be able to trust you because I will go to prison or worse for you if you look me in the eye and tell me you haven't done that. And that made me realize a little bit later on in life that my dad had worries for me as a young black man in the United Kingdom, that he had to start thinking, he was thinking about things like that to actually have to tell me and give me that warning. Suffice to say, I didn't steal any more skateboards after that. And uh, I did still, t I told the truth, more or less as a politician, most of the time. <laughs> and <clears throat> um, this is a situation that I think many people in the United Kingdom who are of color, black and minority ethnic, have to deal with it some time. And I'm gonna talk you through a few statistics. We don't have, our police uh, as a routine do not carry weapons. And yet black people, there are armed response units, black, black, black people like Mark Duggan and others are still shot and killed disproportionately compared to their white counterparts. Our police don't routinely carry, carry tasers, but more, more of them now uh, do in special circumstances. And if you're black, you're four times more likely in the United Kingdom to be tasered um, by the police. On stop and search, black people are eight more times likely to be stopped than white people. Um, on police uh, deaths in police custody, again, black people, out of 17 people restrained who died in police custody, eight out of them were black. And we only make up 3% of the population. 
we're four times as likely to be incarcerated in the United Kingdom. So there is clearly a problem, and one that you would probably understand here in the United States. And we have to ask ourselves, how do we combat that? How do we change that? Well, first of all, in our country, we had something called the McPherson Report that was published after the death of Stephen Lawrence. You may know of this case. He was a young black man and a, with a, a bright future as an architect before him who was murdered by a gang of, of white racists. And again, his family didn't receive justice. The police were eventually, after years and years of campaigning, it was discovered, I say discovered, discovered that the police were institutionally racist. And yet in the United Kingdom, I would say things haven't moved forward as they should have after the McPherson report. Clearly they haven't because of the statistics that we're still talking about here and now. Now I'm pleased to say that there are some people, some of them here today, um, we have uh, uh, my colleague Simon Woolley and uh, Nero. Nero, I'm, I, I struggle with your surname, so I'm just going to say Nero at the moment. Um, and Nero from Number 10's Downing Street Policy Unit, who are working on building a policy for a race audit to ensure that every single department across government, if they get their way, will be able to be tracked and have their feet held to the fire to ensure that each of those different departments, including the Home Office, which are responsible for policing, are doing what they need to do when it comes to tackling racism within our, the racism within our police force and our justice system. Now, the other thing I will say is that it's also about leadership. And I'm really proud to say that the first ever black woman in parliament, and she's been there for almost 30 years now, has recently, under the new leadership of the Labour Party, become one of the highest uh, holders of, of, of a black position in uh, opposition that you can get. And she's the shadow home secretary. And that also is where black people can make a difference. Because I know Diane Abbott, uh, as a black home secretary, would ensure she will do more than hold the police's feet to the fire when it comes to racism in our police force. She will do more than ensure that we have an accountable justice system, or that isn't specifically her responsibility. She will speak up at the highest levels of government for black people in our country. So making sure that you have the right leadership in your country, people in positions of power, is critical. But you also have to make sure they have the support behind them. Now, as a black politician in my country, it is sometimes a dilemma. I come from a constituency which is 98.7% white. Um, it's a real privilege to represent my fellow constituents from Norwich South. But nonetheless, I have to think very carefully about how much I'm prepared to stand up and talk about a topic that doesn't resonate with them always in the way that perhaps it should. If I call out structural racism, if I call out issues within our police force which are institutionally racist, within our justice system, then I will draw fire from the press and sometimes from my own colleagues for what they will say is, well, this guy's got a bit of a chip on his shoulder. He's not very happy with the way things are. If you don't like it, you know what to do. So ultimately, that is a challenge for black politicians in my country. But the more of us there are, the more support we have, and the more that our colleagues understand that actually the struggle of black people is disproportionately part of a wider struggle, as I was saying yesterday, which is of a class struggle. You're either part of the 99% or you're supporting the 1%. There is no in-between ground. Yeah, you're either part of the 99% or part of the 1%. And so much of what affects black people, disproportionately, yes, compared to other white people, but also disproportionately affects our white working class colleagues and comrades who are also more likely because of their class, because of poverty, because of their position in society, to also end up disproportionately in the justice system, disproportionately abused and penalized by our police forces. So our message is quite clear. We have very many similar problems to you in the United Kingdom. Fortunately, our police, as routine, do not carry guns. We look over in America aghast at what happens to black people so often. I have been into the criminal justice system in the US, into Texas. I have seen the reality of it. It is not pleasant. It is not something I would want to see replicated in the UK, but the UK is by no means 
a beacon of enlightenment. Um, so I think critically, oh, I hope it's nothing I said. I hope it's nothing I said. Uh, but critically, I will finish now. Critically, uh, I think I'm being called off. Critically, thank you very much for what I've said. And critically, I think we'll hear the other speakers. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm so sorry to, to hurry you off, but my understanding is that there has been a, a vote called. Um, uh, and we are, it's uh, my great pri privilege. Uh, no, there has not been a vote called. Huh? <clears throat> okay. Uh, we're going we're gonna to go back to it. Um, so we're not, we're not going to be uh, ending this, but I would love um, uh, to be able to, to welcome uh, uh, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, who is one of the uh, most influential voices uh, uh, in Congress. And if you've ever heard her speak, you understand why. She not only speaks her mind, but she speaks for those who don't have a voice there. Before I get uh, yanked off, please join me in welcoming Representative Sheila Jackson Lee. Dr. Goff, thank you so very much for your genius and commitment and passion. Uh, just a few uh, minutes ago, I was sitting in the town hall meeting that focused on freedom, justice, and equality, and the presence and the surging of the power of black women. And that does not mean that I want all the gentlemen to run out of the room. But as I spoke, I said my dream, um, based upon our theme, uh, as the dream demands, is a complete reformation and overhaul of the criminal justice system. We've got to do something, and we've got to do it now. And that is why I'm very pleased to welcome you to the Judiciary Brain Trust, of which we carry on from Mr. Conyers, who held it for so many years. We are committed to taking all the seeds that were planted, and my new theme is to give everybody a toolbox, because we can analyze, reanalyze, rediscuss, discuss, but if we do not take a toolbox to our respective law enforcement, DAs, supporters of criminal justice reform, parents, children, schools, local elected officials, state legislatures, then all the way up to the most powerful law-making body in the world here in Washington, the United States Congress, then who are we and what are we doing? And so as I listened um, to the panelists, let me first of all uh, thank, of course, our moderator and acknowledge uh, Brother Clarence Cox of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement. Glad that he is here. And uh, we just heard from Clive Lewis. Thank you so very much for your presence with the Helsinki Commission. And also Dr. Keith McGee, uh, who um, has encouraged us in his stay in London to make sure that we're doing extensive exchange. And we look forward to that cross the pond interaction because we're all in the same water right now. So we thank you very much. Uh, is it Ganesha Martin with the Cleveland Police Department? Yeah. And Texas. from Texas, <laughs> Cleveland, Texas, right? No, no, no. Yeah, I'm with, uh, I am, I work with the Cleveland Police Department. Okay. Oh, she said, okay. and from Texas. I, wanted, yeah, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> and from Texas. Yeah. All right. Uh, and she deals with the Cleveland Department's consent decrees monitoring team, very important. Nicole, thank you so very much for being here. M. Austin Hillary, dear friend, we're fighting fights uh, constantly. Uh, and uh, Daryl Washington with the National Bar Association, uh, did he make it? All right, well, we thank him uh, and uh, Dr. Walters. Uh, but I do have Dr. Elsie Scott, uh, who is the director of the Walters Institute at Howard University and soon to be the interim uh, executive director and president and CEO of the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. So we're delighted. And Ms. Young, Ms. Young, thank you very much. So I will be, I'll come back uh, as uh, the votes go, but let me be very clear. Uh, some members of this panel who come from Dallas, Texas are not here uh, because they are attending a funeral of a young man by the name of Botham Jean. Amazing, I don't know how stories can get more incredulous by the moment. And so I didn't finish my few minutes ago dream as I sat on the town hall stage. And as I've become immersed in this issue of criminal justice reform, and we have a whole array of issues. Right now we're in the midst of a fight to not pass the Violence Against Women Act, which incorporates women of color and people 
for we were innovative enough to put the word people, recognizing abuse can be in many forms. We were innovative enough to know that Native American women needed to be included, or immigrant women needed to be included, or in fact, law enforcement needed more money to be able to assist in these cases. Because we're not against law enforcement, we are collaborating with law and order that gives the right for all of us to be treated with the dignity of laws that respect us and keep us alive. So in that town hall meeting, I said my dream is this reformation, this whole change, bottom up, that needs to be addressed. Doesn't mean that I'm indicting the numbers of African American and people of color that are in law enforcement and other good officers that you work with all the time. But that's where we get stuck. We are asked to not speak because it is like we are calling out names that we don't call. So if we speak about what happened to Tamir Rice, or Walter Scott, or Michael Brown, or Eric Garner, or Brother Diablo, or Sean Bell, or the brother in Sacramento, or Sandra Bland, that we are wrong to be speaking. That there is a lack of connection to our citizenship that we can't argue against wrong behavior that winds up having more mothers that look like me bending over caskets at the hand of the government. You see, what will come back to us is a racial comment. And that is that more of you are being shot by guns. Look at Chicago. Did I say I was ignoring Chicago? Did I say that I didn't have any knowledge about violence dealing with guns that happened to have us at the other end? No. What I said was a reformation of the system. And that means I will purge throughout. Remember what I said, gather tools. But what we must do with these three panels, of which I'm excited about, and I will be in and out, is to make sure that we have our birthright and our credentials of citizenship that allow us to speak against wrong and ill. And yes, as we always say, speak truth to power. I have a long list, litany of wonderful notes that they've given me. But if we get anything out of this 21st century judiciary brain trust, it's to not have you come and sit and listen, but to go back energized. How many people speak to the district attorney when you're not talking about someone who's dead? How many people make it their business to have a weekly, that's too much, monthly meeting, quarterly meeting? When have you talked to the chief of police, all public officials, council members who are not your friends? local elected officials, people dealing with law enforcement and the criminal justice system all the time, prison officials, jail officials. And so I will leave this podium baffled about Mr. John's death, but I am not without tools, for I will speak from now until we change this House of Representatives and elect people for the people. I will ask the Judiciary Committee to hold hearings on trying to understand what are the overall policies of policing as it relates to an individual's house and a knock on the door that allows them to go in and shoot a person standing and looking at them. Now, we don't have all the facts, so I will have to operate without facts I will not be blasting, I will just be saying, I'd like an inquiry, I'd like to have witnesses come and explain to me police policies. I'm taking tools in my toolbox to use. And so since I might miss the vote, I'm going off the stage only to emphasize, you see I'm animated here, that I want more from this judiciary brain trust, Brother Cox. I want to you to give them some tools to deal with it. And am I right about meeting with the chief and the district attorney before you are saying we're here because we're mad and because someone is dead?
God bless all of you. I'll be back and forth, and I hope I'll see some people walking out with a toolbox. Thank you all very much. See, I ain't trying to get in the way of all that. <laughs> Thank you, Representative Jackson Lee. Um, <clears throat> So just a note of apology in order to manage all those logistics. We were uh, ruder to our, our friend from across the pond than we would normally be. I normally wouldn't yank you off the stage That's like that. Cool. Yeah, but, say, but I was trying to save you, trying to go before rather than after, right? I know I live close to, to the Apollo, but I'm not trying to be the Sandman to you. Um, uh, Representative Jackson Lee was talking about uh, tools, and I wanted to, to comment after uh, Brother Cox had spoken just briefly. The FBI, as I think you, you all know, and as, as Brother Cox uh, mentioned, has a, an attempt to collect data on use of force. The less than 5% of American law enforcement says that they want to engage in, and it is a request. Please give it to us. There are no consequences if they don't. I think it's important that folks know that the Washington Post and the Guardian have the most comprehensive um, uh, databases of police-involved shootings. Police-involved shootings are less than 1% of the use of forces across the United States. A use of force is an incident that could send somebody to the hospital. The largest database of, of use of force is actually held not by journalists, but by nerds. Center for Policing Equity National Justice Database, that's a National Science Fo uh, Foundation funded uh, enterprise, has about a third of the United States in its database. And folks don't know because we're nerds. We're bad at talking to people. I thought y'all knew. Um, <clears throat> but there are these efforts out there. I think it's incredibly important that we make efforts to connect with the folks who are having those conversations on a weekly, on a monthly, on a quarterly basis. I want to clarify that. Um, so, Brother Lewis, if you, if you want to come back up at the end, we're going to give you first right for the Q&A. But you've said that, that you're okay to go ahead and yield the rest of your time. Um, as the gentleman your mother always knew that you would be. Um, so now it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Elsie Scott. Dr. Scott serves as the founding director of the Ronald Walters Leadership and Public Policy Center. And we just found out that she is about to be the interim uh, CEO and executive director of the CBCF. Congratulations to her and the CBCF. Um, Dr. Scott has served as the executive director of uh, Noble and as deputy commissioner of training to the uh, NYPD. Uh, she also held senior and supervisory roles in the police departments of Detroit and the District of Columbia um, and with the U.S. Department of uh, Homeland Security. She's taught political science, um, <clears throat> urban studies, and criminal justice at several universities, including Howard, Rutgers, University of Central Florida, North Carolina Central University. She earned her degrees in political science from Southern, where she also got to see the greatest marching band in the history of the United States. Um, <clears throat> and the University of Iowa. And I think the most important thing for us to know, for those of you who are unfamiliar with her work, is that this is a woman throughout her entire career who has created systems where people could be great. And greatness in the context of, of criminal justice is often a system where people are able to listen to the voices of the young and the vulnerable. Those are the people closest to the problem. And in all of criminal justice, those who are closest to the problem are gonna be closest to the solution. I look forward to hearing her words today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elsie Scott. I'm in a bad situation after that great introduction and also after Congresswoman Jackson Lee, who I'll be working very closely with for uh, uh, coming weeks, then I just have to redirect my presentation. You know, I had some paper here, but we're going to throw that away while the Congresswoman was up here. I started rewriting my speech. I've been known for doing that. have to stay ready. So uh, what... I want to do is maybe try to figure out how to put something in your toolbox as opposed to, I was originally going to talk about some of the work we were doing at Howard University, but I brought one of my graduate students with me who just got her master's, Naya Young, so she can talk a little bit about some of the work we are doing there. But we wanted her to come here and bring a millennial expect, uh, perspective to this discussion because often you sit down and you hear from those of us who've been around a long time and you want to say, well, what are the young people? Because the young people are the ones, many of them having more problems with law enforcement and the criminal justice system than some of the others of us. So let me just put this in the context of where we are today. We are a few months out 
from the election, from the midterm election. And this election is very critical because we think back to November 2016. What a difference an election can make. Did we ever think that things would turn around so fast, some of the progress we were making in criminal justice, that they just came in with a playbook almost. Everything that had, everything progressive that had been put in place by the U.S. Department of Justice, let's slash it, let's take it off the books. So we now have an opportunity now to at least change the Congress right now in November. So what do we need to be doing? I worked with the Black Women's Roundtable on yesterday we released uh, the poll, we, a joint poll we do at Essence Magazine. And interestingly enough, what were the top three issues of black women as we go into this next election? Hate crimes and racism, criminal justice and police and reform, and gun violence and gun safety. All somewhat related to the criminal justice system. So what can we do? We have to look at candidates. Who's running for office? What kind of commitments are we getting from these people before they get elected? When I think back to when I was in college and when Maynard Jackson was running for mayor of Atlanta, one of the big issues was police brutality in the city of Atlanta. And we got a commitment from Maynard Jackson that he was gonna change the police system there in Atlanta. And when he got elected, that was one of the main things he started working on. He went to remove the chief of police who had ignored all our concerns about what was happening to black people. And what happened? He refused to leave office. He stayed there in the chair and called out the SWAT squad to protect him. And so, but Maynard Jackson was not deterred because he had a mandate from the people what he did. He created a super chief position called Commissioner of Public Safety, took all the power of the chief of police and gave it to this commissioner, and we kept on going. So when you start looking at your mayoral candidates and other people that are running for office, look for people going to be bold leaders who are not going to be deterred, who make promises and keep those promises because you are going to hold them accountable as we go forward. And we are finding more people, more people of color are running for prosecutors and for judges. But get committed just because they're of color does not mean that they're going to get in there and do the right thing. In Philadelphia, you all had to change your prosecutor because he wasn't doing the right thing. You got a progressive. He's not a person of color, but you had a progressive in office in Philadelphia now. We need to look at candidates who are about police reform, who are going to take the 21st century police report, and continue to implement it, even though you have a Justice Department that's not going to implement it. It was a good report, and it can even go further. But it's up to you as citizens to make it work for you. There was a lot of bipartisan issue, a bipartisan uh, movement around sentencing and other issues in the, in the Senate during the last Congress. What has happened to that now? Let's put that back on the table. We are seeing justice turn everything backwards, but the Justice Department is paid for by our tax dollars. So we need to look at how do we make the justice system work for us. We need to look at what legislation we need around women's issues, because often we think about criminal justice, we think about the black men, black men being killed, black men being hurt, but the justice system is turned on black women too. And so there are a lot of issues that black women are dealing with, just like black men. So we need to combine forces. In Florida, there's an initiative on the ballot to get voting rights back for persons who have been convicted and have served their time and come back into society. We need to do, we need to get people out to vote and make certain that that ballot initiative passed. Look at all the initiatives that are on the ballot in your cities and your states your counties, there are a lot of initiatives that you might need to be voting for or against. 
you know, too many people go in there on election day, and I think my time is about up. Too many people go in to vote, and they haven't read anything, and they're trying to figure out inside the booth as to what you need to vote for, and you often vote the wrong way because you have, don't have time to read it. The last election here in D.C., lines long, nobody's there. Why does it take so long? Because this man's standing there trying to read all the ballot initiatives that he should have read before he left home. And don't just because you see somebody's name that it sounds like the right person, like what happened in South Carolina the other, about four years ago, I think, where a man was on the ballot and people said they voted for him just because his name sound black. He was black, but he, did, he was not deserving of that office. So make sure you educate yourself, educate your community, take your family, take everybody to the polls in November, and make certain that we get criminal justice reform continue to happen in this country. Thank you very much, Dr. Scott. As she mentioned, she brought with her one of her current students, um, who was a powerhouse in her own right. Naya Young um, received her MA from Howard in political science in May of 2018. That means just, you know, May. Um, <clears throat> For the past three years, she served as a graduate assistant at the Ronald Walters Leadership and Public Policy Center at Howard. She conducted research and carried out programmatic activities for a project funded by the U.S. Department of Justice COPS Office, funded back when we, you know, yeah, um, <clears throat> when they were doing that sort of thing. Uh, the project engaging uh, college students in 21st century law enforcement involved conducting focus groups um, of black college students. She also has served as an intern at the Washington Bureau of the National uh, Urban League. This is a new voice to me, but it's a, a voice that I am excited to hear what she has to say. Please join me in welcoming Naya Young. Hello. Can y'all hear me? Hi. Um, so my name is Naya Young, um, as previously stated, I just recently graduated from Howard with my master's in political science, um, focused in public policy and international relations. Um, I'll try to keep this brief so we can get to Q&A. Um, so I was uh, introduced uh, to law enforcement, um, not by choice, in uh, April of 2014. Um, I'm from Tampa, Florida. Um, my grandfather was uh, my grandfather was uh, let's say a victim of police negligence. Let's say that. Um, so my grandfather was a diabetic, and if you are not familiar with um, diabetics or you know how severe it can be. Um, and if you're not sensitive to it, then it's very easy to, you know, mistake someone who may be having a diabetic episode or if their sugar is going low um, to be, you know, disoriented. Or you may think that they may be um, under the influence or so. And so that's basically what happened to my grandfather. And, of course, with him being, you know, a large black man, um, he was automatically seen as a threat. And the result with that is, you know, he, he lost his life. And so the time following that, um, I was one of those angry teenagers that you saw in the street. Um, you know, I was the NWA, all of that. I was not with it. I was, didn't want anything to do with police. And in 2015, um, my family, um, we passed the Arthur Green Jr. Act which basically um, is an act that requires that all law enforcement go through um, diabetic training to basically be able to um, assess if who are, you know if uh, um, someone that they're pulling over is you know having a diabetic episode or if they you know need help, and that was a, a very you know that was a huge win a victory for our family even though you know it's not going to bring you know our grandfather back. There are a lot of people, you know, in the world that have diabetes, and this could could have happened to anybody. Um, 2015, summer of 2015, I came to D.C. to start my master's program, and that is when I met Dr. Scott. And I was like any college student; I was looking for a job, 
And um, Dr. Scott said, well, we have a grant, you know, from the cop's office. And, um, you know, if you need work, I said, the cop's office. I don't want to work with law enforcement. <laughs> like, what do you mean? And um, so I was like, okay, you know what? I, I need a job, you know, let's, let's, and I, at that point, I was, I kind of gotten out of my angry stage. And I was like, okay, I don't want to be angry anymore. What, what can I do to, to make sure that this doesn't happen to, to anyone else? How can I be a part of this solution? And so I began working on this grant with Dr. Scott, and it was um, focusing on engaging 21st century um, college students in law enforcement. And so we went around the country, um, and we were conducting focus groups, mainly at uh, colleges with either HBCUs or that had a, a large um, population of black students. And what I found you know, what we found during those focus groups is there are a lot of students that not, it's not that, you know, we're, yeah, we're angry and, you know, but it's not that, you know, all, you know, forget the police. You know, we don't, we don't want the police. We want change. We want to believe that, you know, when you call the police that they're going to help. You know, we don't want to think, you know, or have to second guess, you know, should I call the police? Because I don't want to end up the person that's, get, you know, going to jail. I don't want to end up being the one that's dead. We don't want to think like that. Nobody wants to think like that. What we want is accountability. We want transparency. We want honesty. We want collaboration. We want our, vers our voices to be heard. These, you know, protests and these kneelings, the things that you see in the street, that is our attempt. We are to force accountability. This is what we want. And so I am here to, you know, offer that millennial perspective. Um, you know, a lot of people think that millennials don't care about anything. Um, we care about a lot. I mean, y'all see all these hashtags we freaking out here? Okay. <laughs> um, you know, we, we care about a lot. And, you know, so... I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, I'll be the millennial speaker for us today. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me to this panel. Thank you, Dr. Scott. And um, I look forward to you guys' questions. Thank you. I'll be honest. I I'm a little insulted that she didn't assume I was also a millennial. <laughs> I just feel like, you know, don't let the smooth taste fool you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, our next speaker is one of my favorite people um, in criminal justice reform and law enforcement. I am not going to talk about all of our shared history. Um, that will be a BET special sometime <laughs> next year. Um, <clears throat> uh, we encountered each other first um, when uh, the Center for Policing Equity began working in the Baltimore Police Department. Um, <clears throat> it was before there was a consent decree. It was before the tragic events surrounding the, the death of Freddie Gray. It was when um, the commissioner at the time, uh, Anthony Batts, knew that there were problems and that no police department in America can solve the problems of race and policing on its own. Um, at that point, Kenesha Martin was, um, I believe at that point you were chief of staff? Right, um, uh, but she had already been, let me go, get to, go to the notes here, um, the assistant deputy mayor, um, uh, and was on her way to being uh, chief of department uh, of justice compliance and accountability and external affairs for Baltimore Police Department. This is the woman that helps the commissioners not do terrible things that make black people die and angry. That range. You didn't know that there was someone like that in a police department because there's usually not someone like that in a police department. It's not structurally set up that way. And to be perfectly honest, there are very few who have that specific skill set, who can talk cop and talk community member at the same time, and most importantly, who can talk sense. It is a rare, rare set of talents accumulated in one person. This is the reason why Baltimore just couldn't hold her. Um, <clears throat> she is now sitting on the, uh, the monitoring team for the Cleveland Police Department um, in the wake of uh, the violence in Cleveland, particularly in the wake of the Tamir Rice shooting. Um, there are very few people who can um, not only have a, a higher secondary degree, but also what I call a GSD degree, 
um, in criminal justice reform. Y'all know a GSD degree? It's the get stuff done degree, right? <laughs> um, so without any further ado, because we are shorter on time, please join me in welcoming my friend, someone I admire uh, deeply, Kanisha Martin. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a, a little different uh, bend at this. Um, I have some kind of bullet points that I'm going to go down just again so that you have something in your toolbox to go home um, and actually um, do something, hopefully um, not only at your level, because I recognize if you're sitting at the Congressional Black Caucus Conference um, that you are probably not living in a neighborhood that um, is infested with drugs. And you're probably not um, driving by vigils every day from somebody who was shot. Uh, and you probably don't have 10 vacant homes that you see rats running in and out of uh, every day um, and trying to figure out how to uplift your life in that environment. And unfortunately, because of those situations, that's where a lot of police presence happens to be when we talk about Baltimore City. Speaking of Baltimore City and Cleveland, I am not from Cleveland, Texas. <laughs> I, do work, um, I do work on the monitoring team um, at the Cleveland Police Department, but I do want to be clear that everything that I say today is Ganesha Martin. Uh, I am not representing the Cleveland Police Department um, today. Um, I was at uh, the police department um, and um, very, uh, I, I, I didn't plan to go to the police department. When I first went there, Commissioner Batts, often looked at the bewildered faces at the conference table and said, it's just because she doesn't believe anything we say. Um, and I didn't. I didn't trust police because of the experiences that many of my family members had had. Um, and often um, they would show a video and um, the police would go, that's strategic. That's, this was this hold and it was this, this, and it was this, this. And they were like, Ganesh, well, what do you think uh, when we show this video on the news? I said, they're going to say you beat his bleep, bleep, bleep and they're gonna be pissed, and they're gonna be hurt. Uh, and so our response has to be uh, education around that was a appropriate whatever mechanism, but also um, the feeling that we get in the black community that this is not how you would have treated um, somebody who looked like you. Um, and so the, the consent decree has been mentioned quite a bit today. Raise your hand if you know what the consent decree is or what a consent decree is. Okay, that happens a lot, and, and, and we talk about it like people understand it. So basically what happens is generally after there is a um, large event um, like um, the death of Freddie Gray, um, like uh, Tamir Rice, where there's a lot of national attention garnered, um, the Department of Justice, particularly under President Obama and um, Loretta Lynch, um, would come into um, to um, departments and start taking a look for a pattern of practice of unconstitutional policing. Um, and when they found that um, pattern or practice, they would then enter into negotiations with police departments, often taking sometimes up to three to four years because you can imagine police departments did not want to recognize that they had issues going on. And if they did, they did not trust the Department of Justice to come in and, and, and treat them accordingly and so you would enter into a negotiations just like if you had a car accident with somebody and they say pay for my fender you can pay for your fender there's a remedy and it's, it moves on for the consent decree it's actually a legal document in which the police department promises to do certain things um, and then on top of that since it's filed in federal court you have a federal judge and then you have a monitoring team that comes in a group of professional consultants to help actually monitor and make sure that the police departments in compliance, um, and then to um, actually provide technical assistance. Um, under President Ob Obama, there's a proliferation of those. Under uh, Trump, I don't call him under Trump, um, <laughs> um, guess how many there are? There's zero, but there was one that actually snuck in before he came into office, and that was Baltimore City. And the reason why that happened is because, as I stated, normally it takes months and months and months, sometimes years, um, to negotiate this. We negotiated in four, hour, in four, four hours, four months, staying up to two, three o'clock in the morning, um, and we actually signed that, that consent decree on the inauguration of, uh, or the day before inauguration. That did not stop uh, Trump and Sessions from coming in and trying to stop it, um, but the police department um, stood up and we said, no, we need this, we want this, 
Uh, so it is the only consent decree under, um, uh, under Trump. And so the question put forth to us is what can you do um, in a situation where we don't have a president, when we don't have an administration that actually uh, cares anything about um, how police officers interact with uh, color, communities of color, quite frankly, um, this administration believes that everything that a police officer does is correct, and if you say anything different, it's treason. Um, and so what I have to say is that you have to go local, which is what we should do anyway. Um, in Chicago, where Rahm Emanuel decided that he was gonna back out of actually having a consent decree um, um, after uh, the death of Michael Brown, um, the actual Illinois um, Attorney General filed um, a consent decree. So there, they, they, it was a, a long fight um, and um, they actually were very successful on that. So um, I would say that you don't, can't maybe look to the Department of Justice, but, but you can look to your local um, law enforcement agencies to actually uh, find unique ways to, to get into the police department. If you want me to sit down, just tell me. <laughs> um, the other thing that, that I, wanna, I really wanna highlight on, a lot of people have talked about your local um, councils, your mayors. Um, after being in the police department and now kind of standing outside, I, I've, I've lost uh, the filter. I really didn't have very much in the first place. But I'm gonna tell you to, to highlight what some folks have said. I have had um, black politicians say to white police commissioners, the only way you're gonna get them under control is to beat them, be violent with them. So as I step back from the police department and I look at the larger ecosystem, we always go to the police. We're always mad at the police. But working inside of a police department, I realize that is a job. During the rise and the unrest, I had a black female come up to me, officer, with tears in her eyes. She said, ma'am, I used to go into the uh, community and there would be an older lady sweeping. She said, baby, it's the one in the red hat. And then when I had to start arresting her nephew, who just got off of two shifts for having an open container, she's not talking to me anymore. And that's when they started hating us, ma'am. That's when they started hating us. So there are police officers every day working in communities that are responding to the politicians who tell them to do X, Y, and Z. We never really talk about that. If you are told that you, in order to get your paycheck, you better come in with 12 arrests, you're gonna find 12 people to arrest. It's the same thing, I don't know what you do in your job. If I was a janitor and they told me to clean 12 toilets and there's only 10 in that building, I'm gonna go find two in another building. I'm gonna get 12 toilets cleaned because I wanna get paid. They're thinking about their family. So when, when you go back and you're talking about police reform, I wanna challenge you that it's so easy for us to sit in our, in our kitchen and talk to our friends and be angry. Oh, they killed another one, of blah, blah, blah. The, we start there, but the conversation cannot end there. You have got to get more involved, and it has to go. You have to talk to your police commissioners. And the ones that don't want to open the door, you force the door open. And I'm not saying that there is not a place for protesters, because my mom laying at Edmund Pettus Bridge um, while I was inside the police department actually changing policies makes a huge difference when the, the, when the, in, when the institution doesn't want to listen. The protesters make people listen. But when you come into the table and you're negotiating with a police commissioner or a person like me who brought the community in and said, we will not change a rule of law or anything without the voices of the people that it affects. You can't come there just angry. You can't come there and demand a safe house that you can run into and the cops can't come. How does that help the community? And I know that's a, you know, a, a out there example, but what I'm saying is I've been in too many police departments that once the protest ends and once the cameras go away, the work ends. And that's when the hard work begins. And so my, my plea to you is that, that we have to take the, the, the rhetoric into action. You do that by holding your, not only your police um, personnel accountable, but your politicians and also educating yourself. For a person who goes into the community and wants to help um, folks get, get community members input on policies, there have to be people like you who go into the communities where they have not graduated from high school 
and take a stops policy, a use of force policy, a how do we deal with people in mental health, um, you know, in crisis. And you have to, you have to make it so that they understand. Give them a platform to then give that feedback to you. It is not good enough for us to sit in rooms like this and be angry and say that there is something. We have to do what the Congresswoman said, which is do a toolbox. And in having a toolbox, you have to be the voice to your community, or if not, fund somebody that is, but do something where grassroots really is actually not just the folks that are in the streets, but the folks who have two and three jobs who can't make it out to protest. Um, so um, I will end with that. OK. Thank you. Yeah, I know all y'all thinking that I'm just giving the Black Power salute. I'm also <laughs> helping folks with time as we're doing that. Um, and I, I want to echo something that uh, Ganesha said that's it's incredibly important. Um, the right honorable, and I've been wanting to say right honorable for some time, the right honorable Clive Lewis um, talked about stats, gave some dis disparity stats. Nationally in the United States, it's about four to one, black folks getting beat up by the, by the cops uh, to white folks. I challenge anybody in the room to tell me what percentage of that disparity we can trace back to poverty. What part of that disparity is educational inequality? What part of that is the history of government redlining and residential segregation? What part of that is the underfunding of mental health and substance abuse resources? There are actually answers to this question. Right, again, I'll refer you to Policing Equity's website. This is what our CompStat for Justice does. It distinguishes between disparities and discrimination. But here is the part that I want to uh, drive home before we get to our last speaker. If we don't make that distinction, then we're robbing communities of their ability to give voice to all the things that ail them. None of the communities that are blighted by corrupt or overly burdensome policing are only blighted by that. None of the communities that are worried about their babies going to the hospital on the bad end of a, a police contact are not also concerned about the school system, the water supply, the availability of jobs, the availability of public health resources. We need to have an understanding of the ways in which these systems work together against the good and the dignity of those communities. And without the ability to start calculating that, we are angrier than we are wise. All right. So with that, I planted him. I pay him good money for that. Appreciate you, bro. Um, with that, our final speaker before we get to the couple of seconds of q and I hope that we'll have less, um, is Nicole Austin Hillary. Uh, Ms. Austin Hillary is, uh, a human, uh, is Human Rights Watch's U.S. Program Executive Director. Um, she leads Human Rights Watch's uh, efforts to end violations in the abusive U.S. immigration system, tackle, and I, I, we can't be uh, out of here without talking about policing and immigration, tackle race discrimination and other rights problems with the, uh, <clears throat> with the domestic criminal justice system, and advocate for national security policies informed by international human rights standards. Previously, she was the first director and counsel of the Brennan Center's Washington, D.C. office, which she opened March 2008. She is also a former Wasserstein Public Interest Fellow at Harvard Law School, uh, currently serves on the boards uh, of directors for Common Cause and the Washington Council of Lawyers, and is president-elect of the Washington Bar Association. Uh, she is an appointed member of the ABA Advisory uh, Committee on Election Law and, and serves as co-chair of the ABA Criminal Justice Section Defense Function and Committee. She is so fancy, but you already knew. Um, <clears throat> She has been, for the entirety of, of her career, which I've uh, followed with admiration um, and support for some time, an invaluable voice for justice and an absolute warrior in the face of false equivalencies. Please join me in welcoming Nicole Austin Hillary. Every time someone introduces me, I always think, where do I send that check? because it just sounds so good. Uh, and I'm like, who are they talking about? Um, one thing that I do have to correct, uh, uh, Phil, uh, is that I am now currently serving as the president of the Washington Bar Association. So, yeah. And I'm glad to see one of our past presidents, Iris Green McCollum, in the room. Uh, and I knew if I didn't correct it, Iris was going to pull my tail coats, uh, my coattails about that. Um, let me tell you all this, uh, and I, I'm going to be succinct because I know we want to get to your questions. We have to have a paradigm shift. And when I talk about a paradigm shift, I mean, and you've heard some of the ingredients that have to go into that paradigm shift. The ways in which we talk about policing and the problems with policing in our communities has to change. It is so easy 
as you've heard Ganesha allude to and others on the panel allude to, for us to get caught up in the anger of what is happening at the moment. We hear the stories about a white police officer going into someone's apartment, uh, like Brother Gene in Texas, and shooting him. And we get riled up and angry, as we should. We hear about young brothers like Tamir Rice playing with a toy gun and getting shot by police, and we get angry, as we should. But we have to be very clear on understanding what is beneath those acts. What is, it, what is it that is happening on a daily basis within our criminal justice system that we need to be aware of and that we need to attack systemically? It is only then that we will start to see real change and reform in terms of policing and the criminal justice system. Part of what I get to oversee at Human Rights Watch is how we tie all of these pieces together. And let me tell you ingredient number one in terms of this paradigm shift. We have got to stop thinking in silos, people. These issues that we are talking about are not just criminal justice issues. They are not just policing issues. They are not just civil rights issues. These are human rights issues. And if anybody tells you that these are not human rights issues, look them in the face and tell them they are lying and they better go look it up in a book and figure out exactly what a human rights issue is. Because people dying in the streets at the hands of government officials, because that's what police are, they're government officials, that is a human right violation. Human rights are, are to mean that we are protected and that our rights are respected. So that's number one in this paradigm shift. Number two is, and Phil's been making jokes about this all morning, all afternoon, but we have to take this seriously. Data and information matters. It is not enough that you know what is on the front pages of our local newspapers. You have to know the numbers behind this information. You have to know what has brought us to this point. And that's part of what we do at Human Rights Watch. We have people on the ground, senior researchers, who are talking to people, who are interviewing people, everyone, not just the victims. They're interviewing the police officers. They're interviewing the commissioners, the mayors, the other elected officials. And we are pulling together data that you need in order to tell these stories and to defend individuals and to go to your legislators and demand changes. It is not enough that you go to your legislator and say, I'm mad. They know you're mad. And guess what? You'll walk in, you'll tell them you're mad, they'll deal with it for those few minutes, and then you'll leave the office and they'll go on to their next agenda item. Because you being mad is not enough. But if you're able to go into their office and say, I know that statistically, more black and brown men are being stopped, and they're being stopped in these particular districts, and this is how these districts are being funded, that data is your weaponry. And you have to have your weaponry. So let me just share a, quickly a few examples of the kind of weaponry that you can use. Because when the Congresswoman talked about her toolbox, weaponry is in your toolbox. That's what you have to have. And weapons are not a bad thing. They're not a violent thing. They are the things that help to embolden you and strengthen you and give you the position that you need to call on real reform. One of the things that we're working on right now at Human Rights Watch is a policing report. And we have used uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma as our training ground. Folks don't know this, but there are more police shootings by the numbers in Tulsa, Oklahoma than we have in many other jurisdictions in the United States. And that's why we have people on the ground there. Let me tell you about a couple things that we are finding that you need to know. Policing in Oklahoma, in Tulsa, has been focused on racial minorities in a very oppressive and violent manner that simply doesn't effectively prevent crime. We want our police officers to prevent crime, and this is what I tell people, and don't let anybody move you from this. We all want safe neighborhoods. We all want to be protected. We all want neighborhoods that are free of crime. But we want you police officers to do that in a way that respects us, protects us, and does not leave mothers and fathers at the end of the day crying because their children have been unlawfully hurt, maimed, or killed. Second thing. Police citations and arrests often lead to prosecutions for relatively minor offenses. So again, it's not just the sexy big stories that you hear about in the news. You need to understand that it is these small issues that folks deal with on a daily basis that oftentimes leads to problems in dealing with our police forces. I'm going to give you a quick example. Just as I was walking here, I had to park my car 
uh, because I, I had to travel and I was running late getting here to you all and I had to park my car. And a gentleman said to me, and not the most kindest of ways, um, you are parked where you have to have a permit if you don't live in this neighborhood, so you need to move your car. And I looked at him and I said, I'm running late for a public speaking engagement. I will just have to pay the District of Columbia the, f the fee for that ticket. Now, it, it invoked for me that that same incident are like incidences that we are hearing about across the country and in places like Oklahoma, where you have sometimes very vocal and overzealous citizens who might take that same situation and do something very differently. So it is not just police officers pulling out guns and shooting people, it is those minor infractions. Now y'all know if I had had to go home and tell my mama that I was arrested because I parked my car where I needed a permit and some overzealous citizen in the District of Columbia decided to call the police on me, that would have been a whole nother thing. But think about how that's happening every day to lots of people, and I'm a lawyer. Think about the people that those things are happening to who are not lawyers, who do not have resources, who do not have friends that they can call up and say, this fool just got me in trouble, I need you to help me out. These are the things happening in our communities that we need to focus on. It is not just those big issues. Also, community policing is a problem in many places, in many jurisdictions. We all remember George Zimmerman. That's another panel for another day and we've talked about that and we're still talking about that. But community policing also has to be monitored and watched. Sometimes just because tools are being put in front of you that you're being told are good for your community, they're not necessarily good for your community. You have to look at how those tools are being implemented, how you are being given access to them, how people are being trained, and how they're being held accountable when they go awry, like a George Zimmerman. These things, too, are adding to problems with policing. And finally, we also have to look at where are the resources going in our communities with respect to policing. One of the things that our research has found is that too many resources are directed into policing, courts, and aggressive law enforcement in general. Again, we want to make sure that there's enough police cars, we want to make sure that there are enough vests, that there are enough police in all of the different districts, but we don't want to make sure that there are too many police that are doing things like going into our schools and adding to the school to prison pipeline issue. We want to make sure that there are not too many police going into our communities and harassing young brothers and sisters who are trying to hold a community day and who, but for the fact that somebody called on them and said, we don't know what they're doing, we think they look suspicious, go and check them out and interrupt the good work that they're trying to do in their community. We want to know about those things. So you have to be focused on all of those variables and all of those issues because all of those things in tandem lead to problems in terms of policing and how we are working in our communities. So I, I, I want to leave you with this. We as an organization at Human Rights Watch are taking a strong stance on making sure that people know exactly what is going on in their jurisdictions, like in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And we're going to replicate that research in other jurisdictions across the country. And that's the beauty of doing that kind of research and having that data. You want to be able to replicate it so that it becomes a tool in the toolbox for folks all across the country, not just in Tulsa, not just in Miami, not just in Cleveland, but everywhere. And we also, folks, lastly, when we talk about the different variables that we have to look at, we have to look at the money. Where is the money going? How is it being used? There's a lot of focus right now in many jurisdictions on risk assessment where they are telling us that in order for us to determine how someone is going to be if they are re-released into the community, we need to use algorithms to determine whether they will again uh, recidivate, whether they will again cr uh, commit another crime. But in many ways, the way those algorithms are working, we are seeing disparities when it comes to black and brown people and how they are being evaluated using those algorithms. So we have to look at the monies and the resources and how they're being allocated and how they're being used. And lastly, I'm gonna tell you this. I want you to come to researchers like Human Rights Watch. I want you to go to the reformers and the advocates like those who are represented on, at this dais. But I want you to be community justice warriors. This cannot be a problem that is solved by one or two groups alone. It has got to be a collaborative and collective effort. And if you look at the history of civil rights and human rights and social justice in this, in this country, it has always been that collective effort. 
So just like I serve as president of the Washington Bar Association, my Bar Association, we are standing at the forefront of social justice. And we are making sure that these issues are part of our agendas. So when you go back to your communities, call on your bar associations, call on your fraternities, your sororities, your church social action committees to do the same. I love that we all get together and that we all look cute and pretty, because you all do. But it is not enough for us to just look cute and pretty. It is not enough for us to make certain that more is not being done. So use your bully pulpits, use your community organizations, and use that collective energy to pull on the research and the data to make a difference. Don't just be loud on the day something happens. Don't just be angry on the day something happens. You must be a social justice warrior continually and collectively, and that is how we are going to truly reform this criminal justice system. Thank you. What a wonderful note to end on. If those, those of you felt inspired um, by Nicole, never fear, this is not the end. She's going to be moderating the very next panel at the Brain Trust. Um, so we have run out of time for questions.